right, well, welcome everybody. This is Matt Orozco from Macab Daily and I'm joined by some fine folks from the Bright Hill Road crew. I'm gonna go ahead and um, have, some, have them introduce themselves. I'm gonna kind of go in the order of my screen. So we'll start at the top left with you, Susie. Hi, Susie Maloney. I'm the screenwriter of Bright Hill Road. Lovely. I'm uh, Robert Cuffley, the director and composer. Thank you, Robert. I'm Colin Sheldon, the producer. Thank you, Colin. Is it okay if I call you all by your first names, by the way? Absolutely. Excellent. Well, um, first and foremost, I want to start by saying I really enjoyed Bright Hill Road. Um, you know, we watched quite a few movies um, as part of the, the work we're doing. And, um, you know, I'm always delighted when I come across something that um, is able to capture my attention, particularly in the middle sections. I think that's the part of movies that tends to be the hardest to, to, to write for. So um, a, a round of, of, of applause for you all on some really fantastic storytelling. And I wanted to start with my first question for you, Susie. Um, you know, what was the inspiration you had in mind when you were writing out the story in the script? Well, um, I've always had this bit of fascination with aftermaths, um, what happens after a traumatic event because I feel like you carry the traumatic event far longer than the effects of the actual event. Um, you know, grief, for instance, doesn't stop when the funeral ends, but everybody still goes home. And so I knew I was going to write a story with a premise that started from an aftermath. Um, I, you know, when we were looking for something to do, it was a thread of an idea that I'd had previously that I hadn't done anything with and I needed something sort of fast and so pulled it out and then added all of the things that I love the aftermath a severely flawed traumatized individual and you know the sibling parent relationships of course are appear in everything I write so did I, I did I even answer the question I'm so sorry if I didn't you went did. off on a tangent there no, you did. I, I really like that. I wanted to actually ask a little bit deeper, you know, you like what you mentioned, you like kind of those are the things you really like to write about. Um, is there any particular reason? Because I definitely picked up on the heavy trauma. I have a question about that later. Um, and, and Marcy's a very, very difficult character. So what is it that draws you to, to those kinds of you know, interactions with those characters? Well, you know, I think like most writers, I'm, I'm, Every time I pick up the pen or put my fingers on the keyboard, I'm rewriting history, usually my own, um, you know, suffice to say. Uh, so, yeah, I think that um, any character that's flawed is human and we need to identify and engage with a character. So we need to see them as human. And I have to, you know, shout out and which you did in your fantastic review. Thank you for that. But, you know, shout out to Siobhan for you know, being this incredible, perfect mix of aggro and vulnerable. You know, like I, she really, really embodied Marcy for me. Yeah, I, um, I definitely picked up on that because I think it's really difficult to portray someone who is going through not just a serious amount of trauma, prior trauma, but current trauma, but also, you know, trying to portray the aspect of detoxing, you know, like in kind of that, like that's, that the acting that it takes, the power it takes to, to, to portray that in a sympathetic way even is really yes. is really challenging. And and Robert, I wanted to go over to you, you know, as as you were directing Siobhan and particularly trying to portray this level of both vulnerability, sympathy, but also a severely flawed character whose choices have, you know, really been the reason why the story is so um, I think engaging. So what was that, how did you get that performance out of Siobhan? Or was there anything you were doing to to help facilitate that. Blackmail. <laughs> and um, no, it was, uh, I don't, well, directors take sometimes too much credit. That's an that's insider secret. So I can't take much, I would, I would guide and I would point, but um, she's to begin with, without any of my adjustments, she's just wonderful. Um, and I was really drawn to this, you know, I'm sure everyone knows what like an inciting, uh, not an inciting incident, but the save the cat references. And in the uh, something that uh, our hero or a protagonist can do within the opening 10 minutes, that's just amazing and makes us fall in love with her. And this didn't really have that. And I kind of liked that. It's just uh, dire, dire. But I, I also think that 
everyone knows an alcoholic, mm. I'm assuming, and, and it's a treacherous road. Um, my dad went down that road and it's very hard to watch. So I think she endeared a lot of sympathies just to the conflict she was going under and the uh, huge bags under her eyes and how haggard she looked. And, and I automatically have symp uh, sympathy for people um, juggling five things at a time or a functioning alcoholic. So she's still doing her job. But uh, I like to think she's the type that would, uh, I was going to say sneak to the bathroom for a drink, but she doesn't even do that. She just drinks in her office. Yeah. Which is, is kind of the sign of someone that's almost wanting to get caught being so brazen about it. So I like that. But to answer back to your question, it's, it's, it's mostly her. Um, we spend our brief time of prep just going over exactly what you said. Where, because you don't shoot a movie in order. Where am I here in the detox? You're at about, you know, this is the early stages. How about here? And now we're going back to the beginning and it's all over. So it's hard enough if you're shooting chronologically, which rarely happens. But here we're bouncing back and forth and back and forth. So uh, I'm just really lucky that she, you know, just hit a home run in, in every case and, and came to play and uh, yeah, just killed it. Yeah, I, I, of course, Susie. <laughs> One of my very favorite moments in the whole film comes right near the beginning when Siobhan is in her office and she takes, and she sort of looks around before she has her little shot and she looks around and the expression on her face is absolutely priceless. It's just like, fuck it. <laughs> she just does, it's my, one of my very favorite moments. Yeah, it says so much with having to show a lot. And I think that that's, you know, I think I picked up that on the review is we're literally seeing someone at rock bottom but we, you don't have to say that. No one has to tell the character that. And usually there's a lot of exposition that explains that this person is, is where they are and there's been things that have happened, but we almost get that right off the bat because of the actions and the things that this person does. And we all know, you know to your point, Robert, we all know somebody either directly or indirectly who's gone through this. And so we know the signs that, that to look out for. And I, I'm gonna come back to the, to the cast in just a moment, but I wanted to go over to Colin and say, what, what drew you kind of to the project from the producing side? You know, was there something that connected you on a personal level? Was it the script or, you know, what, what was it that really got you excited? Um, well, for me, it was actually uh, Robert. Um, he had been executive producer on a previous film that I had done. Um, we kept in touch, uh, having coffees and that sort of thing. And, and um, I, wanted to work with them. And so um, we'd both been kind of thinking that we wanted to, you know, expand into the realm of horror. And so it was it was coming to Robert and saying, you know, do you have anything that that might work in a kind of a contained sort of script that we can do um, and, uh, and just kind of um, make it happen ourselves? Yeah, that's great. Do you, now I'm gonna ask a, maybe a silly question. Do you all work together quite a bit, or is this a relatively new relationship? One of the three of you. This uh, is uh, anyone? <laughs> yeah, this uh, I'll start. I'll start with you, Susie, and then anyone we can add in from there. Oh, this is new. Um, Robert and I have worked together. Um, I, I don't know if I can say quite a bit. The thing is, is you know, he's my brother from another mother. Um, so we have been looking for things to do together for a long time. We did do a short together called Romy, which we'll talk about later. Um, and so this came up, Colin actually asked Robert if he had a horror film and Robert turned around and asked me if I had a horror film. And so, but I, the plan is to work together again and again, I believe. Absolutely. In fact, soon. Yeah, we're hoping. Okay. Yeah, I know that there's some some exciting things you all are working on together. So we'll definitely let folks know at the end where to follow you and, and how to keep in touch. Um, and as you think about, you know, I want to go back to the cast for just a moment and and uh, really get a sense of it was a small, you know, cast. You know, you had a very intimate production. What was it like? Would you, uh, and particularly, did you find it any more less more or less difficult than working with perhaps with a larger cast? And I'll start with uh, you, Robert, and then we'll go to Susie and Colin. Um, I would say neither easier or more difficult because there's, there's so much effort that goes into um, creative effort that goes, that's expanded on a set. And I, I like to think it's the same, whether it was one, a one person show, so to speak, or 20 people, but, but it's, 
I guess it's, you know, what made it simple is that there's hardly any wardrobe changes. <laughs> and you just said there's three people and with the exception of the beginning um, and with the exception of Siobhan, uh, I was familiar, uh, I had worked with the, uh, Agam and Michael Eklund, who I'm sure a lot many people know, um, several times. So I don't know about easier or harder, but uh, it was a pleasure because a director goes in with, with uh, indie filmmaking, always thinking about, you know, okay, so one of my cast, I'm sure they're just gonna suck. And what do I do about that? How do I hide that? How do I camouflage it? But going into something knowing that these three won't let you down um, was just a great feeling of security that I had through the whole movie. And Susie, did you imagine, you know, when you're when you're kind of putting pen to paper and really bringing this thread into a full, kind of a full idea and script, um, did you imagine it keeping it this contained, or was there were there decisions at point to say we need to scale this down because it started much bigger? Oh no, it was from the beginning. I understood that we were keeping it small cast, um, even uh, putting in the you know the the opening scene. Uh, was something that we discussed at length, you know, how can we, Robert did an amazing job of making it seem like it was, you know, a big cast and it really wasn't. Um, the nice thing about just having the three of them is that you knew <clears throat> you could focus on those relationships and you didn't have to set up a bunch of other relationships. And so it gave me room oddly to, um, you know, to really, really put Marcy in a tree and throw rocks at her because she was essentially the only person in the film for so much of it. Yeah, I think that intimacy really shows too. I think that in, when you have such sensitive topics, you know, when you have such a small group of people, it does allow you to kind of feel that a little bit more closely because you're not having to relate to many characters as opposed to the few yeah. you see on the screen. Um, yeah. And Colin, you know, you mentioned you were looking for a horror script. What was the, what, what, where was the genesis of the idea of wanting to get into the horror genre? Um, well, horror is something like, um, you know, back in film school days, we did like a, a student project, uh, School of the Dead. Um, and so I mean, horror had always kind of been on my radar. Uh, one of the earlier films I produced was also, it wasn't horror per se, but it was definitely uh, more genre. And so um, it just, it seemed like something that, you know, that Robert and I and, and, and Susie as well could do and, and do it well. Um, and to be able to um, have a chance at, at finding a market within the, um, you know, the amount of indie film that is being released now, um, it's nice to have an, an audience that you're actually making a film for rather than just making a film and then hoping to find an audience. Such a good point. Like horror, what, what I'm learning about horror, uh, so I've, this is my fifth movie, but my first horror movie is just how incredibly crazy devoted the horror fans are. Holy shit, it's, <laughs> wow. And um, I guess I had, I was saying earlier, I had a, a concern that because this isn't Jason Voorhees slashing people and there's a body count of 19 in act one, that people might not be interested in. But we've been getting really positive write-ups from from just people that are really focused on it, picking up on the things that I never imagined that they, they would transfer from the screen to their brain. That's been really sweet. You are and dead on. Oddly, Go ahead, Susie, sorry. Oddly, I'm one of those uh, fiercely dedicated horror fans. I follow, you know, I, I listen to all the podcasts. I watch uh, all the movies. I love knowing what's coming out. And so, yes, I can absolutely agree the, that the, the horror community, no greater support. Yeah, um, it's true. Intense. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think it's, we'll watch anything. You know, we will watch, you know, pretty much anything you put in front of us. And um, I think the, the thing is, because horror is so subjective, and I'd be interested to hear your opinions on this as well, because you mentioned there's not a big body count, but a lot of the films, you know, particularly in 2020, that, that horror fans really, really rallied around were films like Relic that deal with mental illness and, you know, trauma in a very different way. And I think to some extent, the horror that we hear the most now is the most human kind of horror. It's that psychological, the things that we see happen in our parents, our grandparents that they thought were just, you know, pass it off, don't worry about it. So 
Um, yeah. we'll, we'll watch anything and we'll, and we'll, and we will find connections anywhere. I mean, I think I heard Michael Schumacher talk one time saying that he didn't intend to write Lost Boys um, with all of these connect correlations to, to, to being gay, but people just picked up on it and they think, you know, and so it's, it's we're going to draw those connections. And, you know, Susie, as a horror fan, what are some, were there any inspirations that went into, like, you thought like, hey, that, that's something that really inspired me early on that I had to tell this story. Were there anything early on as far as those tidbits or those crumbs of films or directors, artists, et cetera? Oh, I think that there's, you know, there, there's all, you're influenced by everything you see. But in particular, Robert uh, picked up on, when we did, I did the treatment first, Robert picked on, up on, uh, he said, you should watch Repulsion, which I had never seen. And absolutely, I have to say that that was the deepest inspiration. That movie turned me on. I thought that that was fantastic. Beautifully done, completely unreliable narrator and no idea of what was going on was really happening or, you know, the, when, when things really turn the corner in that film. And I, if, if you haven't seen it, go see or rent it, find it. It's fantastic. But when she leaves work, and um, everything is turned for her where she, uh, she's, you know, just gone off the deep end. All this normalcy around her was just as haunting as knowing that she was just trapped in this crazy brain. It, great movie. Um, but, you know, also Carnival of Souls, a very similar atmosphere there. You know, those, uh, my very, very favorite horror film is uh, Rosemary's Baby. Um, again, you know, themes of isolation and, you know, everybody's against me. You know, these are, these are things I think that, um, again, with the mental illness, you're talking about that, the lodge. Did, I don't know if anybody saw the lodge, but it, same idea, you know, it's isolation. Nobody understands me. That's not what I mean, kind of thing. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going on too long. The paranoia. <laughs> yes. paranoia yeah, yeah, yeah. And the paranoia in Polanski films is just off the charts and repulsion and and particularly Rosemary's Baby, you know, you're almost, you're right there along with them. And I think that that's something truly special about what you worked on at Bright Hill Road is that you're there along with Marcy. Um, you're there with her as she's discovering these things as well. And I think that's really difficult to do. And um, I, I wonder when you think back to some of the characters like Owen, um, what were you, were you, did were you going for the manic kind of um, kind of uh, gentlemanly gentlemanly manic psychopath or was uh, I guess was that all Owen or was that more in the script? Well, um, Eklund brings his own his <laughs> own ideas to a character for sure. But I absolutely have this idea. I mean, uh, we live in Canada where you know the Ken and Barbie murderers are from, and he looked so handsome and um, I had a horrible dream about him once. I was very close friends with a family of a police officer that was actually working on that case. And um, I had this horrible dream about seeing his face turn from this nice boy next door into this psychopathic person that was about to murder you. And that has never left me. And so I do hope that uh, Michael read that in the script and saw that character and that, you know, at least had an influence on his, but he does bring his own persona. He's a fantastic actor and uh, incredibly charming and lovely person. I think that's maybe all the, all the, the ones that can portray maybe the most intense characters uh, I find to be usually are just the sweetest people. Kind of like horror fans, they, we watch the most violent, you know, films, but we are usually just the most docile people <laughs> to begin with. Absolutely. Yeah. And Colin, what about you? What are some, are there any horror movies in particular that have always inspired you or that you've aspired to try and, and bring into to your work in the, in the films that you produce? Um, well, one of my favorites is It Follows. Um, I just, I like, you know, it, it has that building sense of dread that, you know, is there throughout the film and it, it has a few jump scares but it, it is more psychological and and you know all the discussion that goes on online about you know what the monster really is and, and what does it mean and and how many interpretations it can be i i really like films like that that explore you know that people can look inside themselves and you know ask questions about humanity and i think um, it follows it, and Bright Hill Road does as well. And I think that's one of the things I enjoy the most about it. 
Yeah, I think that that there's a lot of there's it's a movie you think about again and again, and I think a good sign of a great film is one that you can't stop thinking about. Um, it makes you ask a lot of questions and sometimes question your own views of things. Um, and when you think about the production, um, where what did you all to, to go into filming last year in 2020 or was it before 2020? Um, we actually shot in the spring of 2019, um, and then we were just finishing up or in the kind of almost done post when the pandemic hit. So it didn't impact us as much. Uh, I mean, we had hoped to do a, a limited theatrical with it, but uh, here in Canada, at least there's really no theaters open. So that didn't really happen. But, um, but yeah, so I mean, it was, I think from when I first talked to Robert to when we were shooting was about four months. Um, so it was pretty fast to get it going and then but it did take about a year to finish off the post on it, so. So it sounds like COVID may have not have taken too much of a toll on the production or the overall kind of release schedule aside from the limited release plans. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it took a little bit longer, I think, just to finish things off, just because, you know, lockdown happened and it makes it hard to, you know, everyone's switching from, you know, working in the office to, you know, editing it or, audio or whatever at home and so yeah there, there was some I think it, it did add some time onto the schedule but we were fortunate that everything was in the can so we didn't have to to worry about that well Excellent. it did mean that we couldn't shoot our our next project and yeah yeah what is what is the next project you all are working on together because I know there's some exciting things coming so what's what's uh what's in the hopper well, we had we were going to shoot um we did a short movie called Penny Whistle uh, with my daughters, of course, because um, that's what good dads do. Of course. That, uh, had, had all the uh, ingredients to stretch out to a feature, but, um, and Susie being the writer, she took it and ran with it. And, uh, but it's with teens and there's kissing and there's fighting and there's stunts. And I was just like, this movie's already small. Add COVID on top of that. I just don't think we can do it. And, and to me, directing is, a lot of it is about sometimes camouflaging the fact that you don't have 20 million bucks. And, and there's an artful way to do it, which I hope I did in, in this film, but I don't know how to camouflage. I don't know how to fake kissing or fake a fist fight, or it just, it just seemed way too difficult. So instead we, um, we pivoted to another short film we had done called Romy, uh, written by Susie. And it also has similar elements to Bright Hill in that the cast is extremely small, three people, and it's in a house. It's, a, it's tech horror. It's about a woman being uh, terrorized by her artificial or about her, uh, by her digital assistant, which is called Romy. Um, so in a way, it's a, it's a perfect COVID movie because um, the cast is small. Like with, with Bright Hill, we all stayed at the hotel. So um, in this case, I'm kind of hoping that if we can find the right house, that the crew can just stay there and not have to leave and bring other germs in with them or viruses, you know what I mean? Just because yeah. safety is a big thing. Um, my agent was saying a lot of COVID is coming from Indies, not so much from big shows because we don't have the uh, financial resources to, to, stead, you know, to, to be extra cautious, I guess, I don't know, but uh, I, I don't want to be one of those numbers that adds uh, to COVID. So I think we would all be super careful. Yeah, that's a, I would agree. Um, I think it's best for everyone to keep all, as many people as safe as possible. Yeah. Um, and you know, given that we've all been, you know, to some extent in, in a form of lockdown in varying stages, is there anything that you all have been watching that you say, hey, um, has there, have you gone back to anything in particular saying, hey, this, haven't got a chance to see this. Is anything that's popped out? Um, can I go? Um, of course. I watch, I rewatch more stuff than I watch new stuff because I'm old. And uh, last week I watched, well, I could actually say every week I watched Dawn of the Dead. Um, and do I even have to say Romero's version? I don't have to say that, right? Okay. No, I think most people know that that's the one. <laughs> the Snyder version is good though. It is. It is. It's not it's not breaking ground. Like Romero did it first and uh, 
talk about a summer camp movie. If you read about the behind the scenes on that, let's do a podcast on that, man. I would gladly There's enjoy. A great documentary on that. I think um, on Shutter it has like George Romero. It's a you know very old documentary, but fantastic look in the production and a movie that still has a message today. Like it's the consumerism message still holds very much true. True. Um, but it's funny you mentioned the Lodge and Relic, both both of which I, I've seen in the last four days, I think, I'd say, very recently. Yeah, both very good and gutsy. I like gutsy. I don't like paint by numbers. Well, I guess this is usually when someone jumps out, of, or do, does anyone have a, a cat that could jump out of the, like, I just, that's, that stuff's so boring. And, yeah. With the stinger, you know, the stinger sound effect every, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Just, to, just to throw you off. What about well, you, Susie? Go ahead. Um, no, I, I don't, you know what, I'm a five-year-old, no matter what I'm watching, I'm, I'm in love with it at the time. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was gonna say that uh, one movie I saw, I watched in, uh, in lockdown was Stephanie. Has anybody seen Stephanie? Fantastic movie. The vast majority of the movie is a young girl, little girl, like a little girl, like tan or something. Um, I, I can't tell you too much about it, but it's amazing. Um, highly recommend. And I also loved The Lodge. What I loved about The Lodge was this uh, feeling where, you know, she was trying so hard to win these kids over and they were just being such little shits and, um, you know, to the nth degree, <laughs> as it turned out. But what a, you know, the, the whole, everybody had their own moment of oh, this, you know, there's no turning back from this. And when, when the kids had their no turning back moment, that was my heart was just like, because I guess in a way, at some point, you start identifying more with the kids. Um, I, so I watched uh, Antebellum. I guess I'm a little ashamed that I did because I went into it knowing it was, um, I, you know, it's, it's a controversial film. Um, but I love Janelle Monet, And so I thought, well, I know I'm just going to love the performances. And, you know, the, I guess the storyline was even worse than I suspected, but it was really pretty clever, but I really wanted it to be supernatural. Mm. I don't know now that I would call it a horror film. I, I haven't seen it. Oh, you haven't seen it at all? Um, well, you know, it's, it, it's a really, really, really good idea. It's really well done. Um, it's a little, the direction is um, a little interesting. Has anybody else seen it? Uh, so what did you think about the ending? I, um, I thought I, I could understand, maybe I'll set this in context. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the spoiler territory, but I will say I can understand why people may have been, I can understand people don't like it because they feel like it might've been a bit of a bait and switch to the point of the supernatural. Like there's a lot of illusions um, to, to, th to things being that way. But I also think if you get over that initial shock of that wasn't what I was expecting, I think, like you also said, there's a lot to enjoy. Um, the performances are absolutely harrowing and it captures something I think that is going to be more and more common in horror is just this, like how is horror manifesting for particular people in society versus just generalized horror? Um, so more specific types of like, this is the fear of, you know, I'm a black person in the United States, you know, the fear is yeah. of, you know, white people or police brutality, like those are very real fears. And so we'll have to have our horror villains adapt to those. Um, but I thought it was really, I thought it was well done. I thought it got a little bit of a harder uh, judgment than it deserved. And it's a very slickly made movie, you know, which is kind of, yeah. if, at the very least, it's very pretty to look at. And I always use my partner as a barometer of if something is generally appealing because she is a you know extremely intelligent doctor, but she also loves the Fast and Furious movies. They're her favorite franchise. So when she wants entertainment, she wants to just sit down, enjoy it. And there's no shame. And I mean, Commando is the Fast and Furious movie of the 80s. So like it's, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, she enjoyed it quite a bit. So I think it's just one of those things that the horror community might have turned its back on it because it wanted something else and um, it wasn't that. But I, I liked it quite a bit. And, and Colin, are, are you watching anything in particular that you're really excited about? Well, it's, it's not horror, um, but I just finished watching Queen's Gambit um, on ah. Netflix. And 
I mean, I'm neither me nor my wife are big chess people. I mean, I can play, but I don't I've never thought about even competing. But it's just an amazingly engaging story um, with, I mean, again, a character who has, you know, substance abuse problems and and struggling to grow up. And it's just it's an amazingly well done film or series. And uh, it's also neat to hear about how long it took to get that film made and the struggles that went to to finally get it, you know, um, on screen. I mean, yeah, it's I think... not horror, but it is genre, right? It's fantasy. A young woman, you know, getting that kind of support in a male-dominated sport and going her whole life without ever being sexually harassed. It's, it's pure fantasy. <laughs> you raise a very good point. <laughs> It, it definitely lives, it operates in a world of, uh, and logic certainly of its own, uh, particularly with un, unnamed drugs that can, you know, both make you tired and also excited and hallucinatory. So um, it's got a lot of ideas. And I think, you know, I think, I, don't, I forget which one of you said it, but, you know, bold guts, it was maybe it was you, Robert, gutsy ideas, you know, bold ideas, I think are what people want to see. And um, if I, uh, if I end with one, you know, kind of question for you all, it's um, what's your, you know, if you're if you're talking to average moviegoer and you're asking them, hey, here's you know, we're choosing between two movies. What's the pitch for Bright Hill Road so they can get real excited to, to go and see it? What's the thing you you really want them to? Susie, go. <laughs> I was just thinking, what would I say to them? Um, I think I'd say that uh, everybody knows a Marcy, and you get to watch her fall apart. Because it is, it's about a, a movie about someone who falls apart. They absolutely, and it's got a great ending. I think that I love that ending so much. I, I almost wept when I realized how I was going to end it. <laughs> Pardon me, I'm my own biggest fan. But I think that that's what I would tell people is that it has a great ending. One thing about Susie is she'll watch even a film that she's written. She'll still jump out of her seat and say, Susie, A, you wrote this. B, you were there when we filmed it. <laughs> so she's I love viewers directors love viewers that react you know romance you want them to cry or you want them to bite their nails and jump out of their seat and yeah repeat viewing she'll keep doing it it's fantastic hey, I'm a 12 year old when I'm watching something now I'm right there with you I think if you if you lose that excitement I mean yeah I think it's a telltale sign you have don't you may not enjoy the mediums as much if you just don't have that level of excitement for them um so I, I'm, I'm right there with you. And I think my, our habits from a younger age is carried through, but they keep us who we are on Absolutely. the same vein. So, so Robert, what's your, what's your pitch to the, to the, to the, to the general public? Um, about Bright Hill, I would say. About Bright Hill. <clears throat> about what, sir? About Bright, Bright Hill? Hill, excuse me, yeah. Um, hmm, Susie said it really well, but, but it's, I like the crumbling, I like the disintegration. But uh, as I was saying yesterday, I really like the gaslighting which is also in repulsion. So that you're constantly asking yourself, is she seeing this or is that guy right that she's just drinking too much? Um, and the stuff she sees, while outrageous, you could chalk up to crazy, nasty, you know, detox dreams, I guess. Uh, I've never had dreams quite like that, thankfully. Um, but- um, Not even when you were coming off heroin? You know what, that's a good point. That's a totally good point. But it's- um, <clears throat> I, see, I'm a methodical guy. Like I love session nine so much that I could marry it. And, but lots of people hate that kind of shit. Like, because it's, it's slow burn. I wouldn't say this is a slow burn, but it is methodical. And I love methodical. That's why Kubrick's my favorite director. But, um, so I'm rambling. Colin? No. <laughs> um, well, I would, say that it, it's um, it's a really engaging story and the performances are amazing in it um, and yeah as Susie said I think it has a, a good ending so I think it's a, a great package of a film to uh, to enjoy yes I'm in full agreement and, and just, just one thing I think horror people are really open to seeing stuff that isn't you know Zack Snyder budget that's micro budget um, don't you think? Like you, you would meet far more than I would, but they seem so open. Like the podcasts I listen to, they get genuinely excited about, oh, what's this Argentinian film I've never heard about? I can't, we've got to see it tonight. 
like that is so infectious. I, I want to be roommates with that person, you know? I have a theory about this, if you're, if you're keen to hear it, um, yeah. which is, I think a lot of horror friends, a lot of horror fans, particularly I'm 35, so I uh, kind of grew up in that video store age. Um, and I think people in horror, particularly, those that were, that the discovery of horror is such a unique experience. It's the only, and only genre films really have that. You know, not a lot of people find the action films. There's plenty of hidden gems, but by and large, you know, you 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 don't hear of a lot of action fans who are so gung ho on action films that they're willing to go to cons for them, or they're willing to put posters in their wall up past the age of like 13, 14, 15, 18. I mean, I'm not. You can't see my office, but it's littered with art prints and posters, horror films. So I'm a, I'm a child. But what I'm saying is, is I think that you know we're so excited for the discovery that. We'll, we, we, will, we will spend more time trying to find one really, we'll, we'll spend, we'll watch 50 bad movies just to get to one good one. And we'll do that because that sense of discovery of telling your friends you saw something that no one's seen or not getting the credit it deserves. And horror fans are probably the most generous when it comes to telling you what to watch and what not to watch. That's why companies like Vinegar Syndrome have an entire business of restoring Yes. almost forgotten films that I, I have a massive collection of movies that some of which I know I'm not going to like but I love to own them because it's someone's art and horror fans appreciate the art whether it's you know something like Terrifier that is there to shock and awe or whether it's something like Bright Hill Road that wants you to really think about things and really focus on the the, the intimacy and the characters and their experiences all of this is, a dip, we all experience horror in a different way. So we're all looking for a different way to get that fixed. And as long as you are open to the idea that you're okay being scared or you're okay seeing something that maybe you don't agree with, then there's a lot to enjoy. And so that, that, ser that search for the next best thing is just ever permanent through horror because we've grown up looking for them. Yeah. Um, can, I have to ask you something, would you marry me? <laughs> Robert, we could be friends. Cause I gotta tell you, I am, I am, I am a huge nerd of all film kinds, but at the same time, um, I have to maintain, I maintain my excitement somewhat uh, in conversation so I can give you all the room to speak and talk about the work you do because the work you're doing is the work I wish I would, I wish I was capable of doing. But hmm. um, it, and it's, and it's admirable to see, again, the work you all have done on Bright Hill Road, um, which comes out, you know, is out this, it's been out this week, July, January 12th. Um, it's on video on demand platform. So iTunes, Amazon, Xbox, Dish Network. Um, so I, you know, highly recommend everybody check it out. And I've also got some great recommendations from you all as well, from some ones to share with those who haven't seen Repulsion, Carnival of Souls, um, you know, The Lodge, Relic, uh, and Rosemary's Baby. Stephanie. Plenty of great, Stephanie. I mean, I've got tons of recommendations from you all. So I want to just wrap by saying thank you all for the time and the opportunity to have this conversation and for the just um, the, the very lively um, and point of, point of view you all bring to it. Um, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, you.